Well, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, like Kim said, I've, I just uh, moved over to Victoria in, um, in July. So I'm still pretty new to the Victoria scene, um, but I'm really happy to be here. And I've been really excited to, to dive into some of, the, some of the local issues in Victoria that we have looked at in Vancouver as well. So um, I, I'm a lawyer for Pivot Legal Society. I've worked with Pivot for almost 10 years now. Uh, when I first started at Pivot, I did mostly housing um, and did a lot of residential tenancy branch cases. Uh, we did a lot of judicial reviews of residential tenancy cases. And then I started working on police accountability and that's really where I've been, been working for the last um, probably six or seven years. And my job at Pivot really has been to help out individuals with police complaints. So when people have uh, complaining against police, they'll call us or they'll walk into our office. And I do a lot of work uh, trying to gather evidence and stories from people to determine whether or not there's an action they can take. We help people through the police complaint process, although it's a very, very flawed system. Um, when it's possible and we have the ability to, we also help people uh, file lawsuits against police. So there's a lot of overlap in the areas that we work in. Pivot is a nonprofit society and we primarily work on homelessness. Uh, police accountability, drug policy, and decriminalization um, of sex work. All of those things tend to overlap um, on each other quite a bit, and we've definitely noticed that policing um, is, is often, you know, relates very, very strongly to the issues that we see in homelessness, uh, certainly issues related to mental health. Often the police become the arm of the, the government, the contact um, that people have, uh, and the source of a lot of the problem. So, um, mostly I wanted to, to obviously experience this meeting and just hear what everyone has to say and, and to be kind of, um, yeah, a listener. But I also wanted to talk a little bit about what our work has been focusing on, um, just so you know where there might be areas where we overlap. And if you hear stories related to these things, then, then definitely want to hear about them. Because it's kind of areas where we're already working. Um, in relation to, to housing and homelessness, the two areas where we work the most uh, in relation to police are policing of homeless encampments. So we were, um, we started out, I think our first case that we worked on was the, uh, the original um, Tent City in Victoria, the Adams decision. Um, and since then we've had a bunch of different cases in Vancouver. We were the lawyers for the Tent City residents at Oppenheimer Park, um, which I think was two summers ago. Um, 58 West Hastings Street uh, site, which was last summer, and then also the um, the site that just recently was in Vancouver, which was called Ten Year Tent City, uh, which is on Main Street and has now moved over to Powell Street called Sugar Mountain. So um, we've also been we're also the lawyers for the Maple Ridge Tent City that exists right now, the Anita Place Tent City, which has been up for quite a while now. Um, for a year. Almost a year, I think. Yeah, it's getting close to it. And a lot of the, the work that we do is, is supporting um, not only the residents of Tent City, but um, also the other groups that have jumped in to help, so like the Alliance Against Displacement, um, nonprofit societies that are giving help. We're, we're there to kind of do the legal side of things, so um, I'll talk a little bit about what we found from our work on, on homeless encampments and, and also talk a little bit about uh, what we're seeing currently with social housing uh, and, and some of the issues that have arisen really really in the last few years um, with people's rights in social housing and when social housing, uh, especially the nonprofit providers, decide to work with police to try to get um, a resident evicted. So um, with, with tent cities, uh, we've seen three kind of really, really big issues with police in tent cities. The first is that um, often before tent cities are able to even establish themselves, so if, if a group of people, or even a small group of people, want to try to um, organize and set up a space where they can be together, uh, we often see police stepping in right away to try to shut it down. Uh, and often what they'll use is bylaws and trespass laws to do that. So the Provincial Trespass Act or municipal bylaws relating to trespass. Over the last couple of years, we've done a lot more work outside of the Lower Mainland um, and Victoria, and we've, we've been talking to 
um, communities like Kamloops and Kelowna, some of the smaller cities in BC, and finding that they're not even able to get themselves off the ground in terms of a tent city, and that um, the police are constantly moving people along, constantly enforcing against people. Um, they're using those laws very, very heavily, whereas in some places like Vancouver and Victoria, they pulled back from using those laws. Uh, they're still being very, very heavily used by the RCMP, especially in smaller towns. Um, when tent cities are able to establish themselves, uh, one thing we've seen from the police is, is a constant presence and surveillance. We're currently helping out um, some residents from the Victoria tent city, um, a super tent last summer, with a wellness check that took place. So when police came in and searched every single tent in the name of looking for someone who they said was injured. Um, we also have some issues with wellness checks that are currently happening in the Maple Ridge tent city. Uh, Maple Ridge police have been consistently going in, searching people's tents or belongings, um, often on the same justification uh, that they want to check on that person for their own sake and for their wellness. So one of the things that we've been trying to do is, is to talk to police and bring complaints so we can try to figure out where the legal line is in terms of where people's privacy are when they're sleeping outside, um, especially if you're sleeping in a tent. So where, um, where, is, where does the kind of boundary exist uh, where police would have to have a warrant, for example, to go into somebody's tent and search their belongings? When can they do it without a warrant? That type of legal question, that's one of the areas where we work um, and we're trying to actively kind of establish so that when people are sleeping outside, uh, they have a better sense for what their rights are. Um, do you know what they are? Can you just let them finish? Well, it's, have it's a gray area, that's the problem. Just so you know, we're so, not going to jump in yeah. when you think. I mean, it's, it's a good question. The, there is no answer to that, and that's the problem, right? There hasn't been a case that's come up to this point to, to decide where uh, that line is drawn and whether or not police can enter somebody's tent, um, either for a wellness check or to look for something, um, or whether or not that person has the same rights as a, as a homeowner would in you know, shutting their door and saying, no, you can't come in here without a warrant. Um, we're hopeful that we can get a, a pretty strong case that says you know, there's an expectation of privacy especially in a tent city, um, and that police shouldn't be able to just go in, open up someone's belongings. Um, probably the biggest tent city that we worked on was in Abbotsford, and one of the things that we saw in Abbotsford was that police were consistently checking on people in their tents. They would try to open up someone's tent. Um, if somebody took protective measures, like putting a lock on their tent, then police would slash the tent. Gosh! So open so they could see inside. So. So the hope is to get some kind of peace of mind and protection for people when they are sleeping outside. Um, and along with that, with the wellness check question, we've also seen police intensity is building evidence. So becoming the kind of uh, the tool for the municipal government, especially. So if a city is trying to evict a tent city, um, they'll often use both police and the fire department to go in um, and gather evidence against the campers. Um, we've seen a progression over time where the first few tent cities didn't really know what to do. Now tent cities are becoming more and more organized and they're knowing how to work with fire department and police to make sure that they're not able to gather that evidence or they, they know what police and fire are gonna say and so they can actively prevent it. Certainly with the fire department, um, setting up the ground rules and safety kind of concerns from the beginning and making sure they're followed is, uh, has been the best way of, of making sure that the fire department isn't used kind of as a tool against tent cities. Um, and we've also really found, um, obviously, the connection between drug use and, um, and addiction inside of tent cities being used against people. Uh, Oppenheimer is the best example of that. In, in Oppenheimer Park, the, the, the tent city was, was shut down primarily because they were able to identify a very small group of people who were actively engaging in, um, in sales, drug sales at the site. Uh, and that was used to justify why the entire tent city had to be shut down. Where is that? Drug sales right here. Uh, open house. <laughs> that's that's that the thing. City? That's the irony of it, right? No. There's it's open a park in Vancouver. No, but it's on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, the other thing that we've really worked on lately is uh, is this question of what what your rights are when you're living in um, one of the nonprofit housing providers, um, which has taken over a lot of the the social housing from from the government body like BC Housing and also from, in Vancouver, especially from private owners. So we had lots of SROs in Vancouver that used to be privately owned. The government bought up 
a whole bunch of them at once, and then handed them over to nonprofits to run. Um, we've had some ups and downs with that, and there's been a lot of tension between some of the nonprofits and how they operate those buildings. Um, as you probably heard from the, uh, the Johnson Street building, there's an ongoing dispute about whether or not those people are covered under the Residential Tenancy Act and if they have rights and what their guest privileges should be um, because often the nonprofit providers will try to restrict guests uh, in the name of kind of safety for the building. But typically those policies are blanket policies. So they apply to everyone regardless of whether or not somebody's brought in someone who would be a questionable guest or yeah. something that's caused a problem. Um, they just say everybody's under the same rules and that's not really what's supposed to happen. Um, in the most extreme side of things, what we've seen with policing and housing now is, an, is a housing provider actively working with police to try to use the police to evict somebody. Um, and the way that that's been happening is if somebody is um, in breach of conditions uh, or commits a relatively minor offense, then the housing provider will actually give that evidence to the police. The police will act on it, and then the individual the will be arrested. Um, and when someone's arrested, uh, they'll have a bail hearing, and, and some of the conditions in bail can be not to go to specific places. Yeah. So the housing provider can ask for a no-go for their own building and effectively evict somebody without having to go through the residential tenancy branch. Mm -hmm. So that's been an, an ongoing issue. Um, we've seen red zones come back, and this is not just in Victoria. We've seen red zones really on the rise again in places like Kelowna and Kamloops especially. So one of the things that we're working on is gathering stories from people who are on red zones who have been prevented from going to places, especially if it's somewhere where they access health services. So the, the health clinic, general you know, practitioner, doctor, um, with the new overdose prevention sites that have come up, if people are red zoned from accessing overdose prevention sites, then that's something that we want to hear about um, because it's obviously a huge problem for them. So uh, that's mostly what we've been working on in the housing world. We've also done a ton of work on policing and mental health. Uh, one of my uh, jobs at Pivot has been to help out with families especially who have had someone um, killed by police. So mm -hmm. if, uh, if an individual who's suffering from a mental health crisis is, is killed by police, um, there's a whole bunch of processes that start investigations and that kind of stuff and, um, and our office gives help to family um, when, when that happens. Um, we've also done some work on this kind of more and more this movement of integrating police into social services. So you may have heard that in Victoria, they're now asking for more officers to be integrated in on the, the outreach teams, the ACT teams. Um, and one of the things that matters there is that it means there's more information sharing. Yeah. So um, mental health providers and outreach workers will share a whole lot of information to police about an individual. Uh, and police have more control over someone's in, in information than they probably ever have been before. One of the reasons why we think that's a huge problem is that in the last five or ten years, we've moved from this, this system, which is called police information checks. So you may remember the traditional criminal record check that existed to find work or volunteer opportunities oh. was to just um, get your criminal record. So if you had a criminal record, that would be disclosed. If you didn't have a criminal record, you'd never been convicted of a crime. You didn't have a criminal record. Now it's much more complicated than that. Um, local police forces have taken control of that system. And they're doing now what's called a police information check. And a police information check can, can include a lot more information. Um, in the worst cases, it's including mental health information. Um, in some circumstances, the police are deciding not to give somebody the results of a check. If there's something there that they think is a problem, they don't like the person, but there's no convictions or no charges, they can still decide just to not provide that person with a check. And that basically means that they're not going to be able to get work or a volunteer opportunity. So because police have access to more and more information about people, um, they're also able to use it in more and more ways against people if they don't like that person. So. Um, that's one of the reasons why we're trying to highlight that as a huge problem. Um, and we're also actively looking for cases where if, if someone has applied for an information check from the local police and they've had mental health information come back or um, charges but not convictions put on their, their check, 
um, or in a worst case scenario that they don't even receive the results at all, at all then definitely let us know about that because we've been trying to challenge those. <coughs> Um, and one of the other things that we're actively working on is, is the question of deemed consent under the Mental Health Act. So there's, uh, there's a challenge that's currently going on with the Community Legal Assistance Society has challenged the Mental Health Act in BC um, because it's the only Mental Health Act of all the provinces which basically completely takes away all agency on a person to decide what their treatment plan is and well, whether or not they should take medication. Here. So. So they're challenging that, the deemed consent laws, and we're supporting any ways that we can. Um, and, and the idea is that uh, if, if they're successful, then the Mental Health Act will have to be changed to give um, people who are, especially who are under an order um, under the Mental Health Act, to give them more authority to choose their treatment plan and not just be subjected to the treatment plan of their, um, of their psychiatrist, who they may or may not get along with. So. So those are some of the main things that we're working on. Um, this is all, you know, a lot of stuff that we've worked on that's been focused in Vancouver, but we're very actively trying to, to work in new places now and, and to, to gather information from new spots. So it's one of the reasons why I'm really happy I'm in Victoria now um, and I'm getting to, to see a lot of new people and a lot of new issues come up. Um, and we also really want to hear what's important in Victoria. So, you know, we might have some things that we've looked at and worked at in Vancouver, but there are actually some things in Victoria that are super important, um, and and we're happy to, to hear about that because we obviously want to work as much as we can with everyone to try to to try to find some of this stuff. I'm going to open up to questions now. Thank you so much. Like holy mackerel.